Okay, you go. Remember your keys this time, bro? Remember your keys, right? I think. When I get people you're going back we're going to try this puzzle again folks so there is a nice little link to federalism fun on google classroom go ahead and click on that let's see if i can get we can do this i got six of you already in thank you david just thank you dylan joel uh Sandra with a k matthew and the win that's Patrick. no that's not that's the win never mind okay i got a lot of new wins to go away
did like a everybody. Like, we were supposed to label our classes and so nobody wanted to do that. And so that's just what I'm saying. The same thing as like people. Regular people are going to be technically So based on what we talked about yesterday and what he just said in the video, is it A, B, or C? Careful, they're in different orders for different people, maybe. Uh, governmental powers divided between the three branches. Governmental power divided between state and local governments. Or governmental power divided between the national and the individual state governments. Uh, go ahead and shout it out, people, by the letter. Is it A, B, or C? C. C. Bruh. 
Yeah. It's, it's A, delivering the mail. Uh, fun fact, if you steal somebody's mail, that's a federal offense. That's a felony and you can go to jail. So, like, don't do that. Crazy, huh? Three kids, three kids. Oh, one kid. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Very nice. They're getting it. The government takes care of other things like driver's license, hunter's license, barber's license, dentist's license, License to kill, that's James Bond. And that's in England, and that, I hope the states don't do that. Pretty simple, right? Maybe not. For one thing, there are some aspects of government that are handled by both the state and the national government. Taxes. Americans' favorite government activity are an example. There are federal taxes and state taxes. But it gets even more complicated. Nice. Uh, what is an example that something national and state governments both have the power to do? This one's unfortunate. I did it last week. It was... Wasn't actually as bad as I thought. Wait, wait, wait. This one's nice here. And this one is. Nice here. Alright, what is it, people? B. Taxes. Taxes, that's right. Uh, taxes. So I pay state taxes and I pay federal taxes. And when you get a job, you'll get the same thing. Great. You'll see on your check that there's these minuses and they literally take money from you every week. And by great, I'm being sarcastic. It's not true. Stay focused up here for us, please. Complicated because there are different types of federalism depending on what period in American history you're talking about. Ah, uh, Stan, why is history so confusing? Ah, uh, Stan, can you tell me? Can you tell me? Basically, though, there are two main types of federalism. Dual federalism, which has nothing to do with Aaron Burr, usually refers to the period of American history that stretches from the founding of our great nation until the New Deal, and cooperative federalism, <coughs> which has been the rule since the 1930s. Let's start with an easy one and look at dual federalism in the thought bubble. From 1788 until 1937, the U.S. basically lived under a regime of dual federalism, which meant government power was strictly divided between the state and national governments. Notice I didn't say separated because I don't want you to confuse federalism with separation of powers. Don't do it! With dual federalism, there are some things that only the federal government does and some things that only the state governments do. This is sometimes called jurisdiction. The national government had jurisdiction over internal improvements like interstate roads and canals, some cities to the states, and tariffs, which are taxes on imports and thus fall under the general heading of foreign policy. The national government also owns public lands and regulates patents, which need to be national for them to offer protection for inventors in all the states. And because you want a silver dollar in Delaware to be worth the same as a silver dollar in Georgia, the national government also controls currency. The state government had control over property laws, inheritance laws, commercial laws, banking laws, corporate laws, insurance, Family law, which means marriage and divorce, morality, stuff like public lewdness and drinking, keeps me in check. Public health, education, criminal laws, including determining what is a crime and how crimes are prosecuted, land use, which includes water and mineral rights, elections, local government, and licensing of professions and occupations, basically what's required to drive a car or open a bar or become a barber or become James Bond. So, under dual federalism, the state government has jurisdiction over a lot more than the national government. These powers are... Alright, who had more power? Under dual federalism. This one's kind of tricky. That's why there's only two options. Somebody shout it out. States. The states, right? So up until the 1930s, the states had most of the power in our country. Okay? That's why things like the Civil War happened, right? States were fighting to make sure that they were able to maintain uh, their power. So state governments, very nice. Don't worry, things change. Do we want to see? I don't know if I want to see. Okay, not, not terrible. Powers over health, safety, and morality are sometimes called police power and usually belong to the state. Because of the strict division between the two types of government, dual federalism is sometimes called layer cake federalism. Delicious. And it's consistent. Alright, because of the strict division between the two types of government, dual federalism is sometimes called <coughs> layer cake, cup cake, apple pie. <laughs> apple pie, right? It's the most American thing I'm thinking. Layer cake. Layer cake. Man, it's you guys. A layer cake. Give you guys a sec. That's five people. Frankie, you paying attention? Did you select the correct answer? Mm -hmm. oh. Oh, you know. All right. Good. Oh, somebody said apple pie. <laughs> 
consistent with the tradition of limited government that many Americans hold very dear. Thanks, Bob Bubble. Now, some of you might be wondering, Craig, where does the national government get the power to do anything that has to do with states? Yeah, well, off the top of my head, the U.S. Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 gives Congress the power to regular commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. This is what's known as the Commerce Clause, and the way that it's been interpreted forms the basis of dual federalism and cooperative federalism. For most of the 19th century, where does the national government get the power to do anything that has to do with states? What document is it? People, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence? Okay. Yes, it's in the Constitution, people. Uh, Declaration of Independence, just to always keep in mind, while it is an amazing document, it's just a list of ideas that a government is supposed to be based on. It's not a legal document. You can't go to court and say, but it says in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. It is just a list of ideas. The actual law of the land is the Constitution. Okay? Just kind of keep that one in mind. So it's just some and then the Commerce Clause is just a way that the government finds its way to kind of get its fingers into anything that it wants to. Okay? Remember that, because it's going to use it in all kinds of weird ways. Okay. Constitution's Commerce Clause. Come on. Two people. In the 19th century, the Supreme Court decided that almost any attempt by any government, federal or state, to regulate state economic activity would violate the Commerce Clause. This basically meant that there was very little regulation of business at all. FREEDOM! And this is how things stood, with the U.S. following a system of dual federalism, with very little government regulation, and the national government not doing much other than going to war, buying or conquering enormous amounts of territory, and delivering the mail. Then the Great Depression happened, and Franklin Roosevelt and Congress enacted the New Deal, which changed the role of the federal government in a big way. The New Deal brought us cooperative federalism, where the national government encourages states and localities to pursue nationally defined goals. The main way that the federal government does this is through dollar dollar bills, y'all. Money, is what I'm saying. Sam, can I make it rain? Yeah? All right, I'm doing it. I happen to have cash in my hand right now. Oh yeah, take my federal money, states. Regulate me up. Regulator. This money that the federal government gives to the state is called a grant and aid. Grants and aid can work like a carriage encouraging a state to adopt a certain policy, or work like a stick when the federal government withholds funds if the state doesn't do what the national government wants. Grants and aid are... Grant and aid can act as a carriage to encourage states to follow federal demands. True or false? What is it? True. True. What is the carrot usually? Money. Money. It's always money, people. Everything in government, unfortunately, revolves around the money. They are usually called categorical because they're given to states for a particular purpose, like transportation or education or alleviating poverty. There are two types of categorical grants and aid, formula grants and project grants. Under a formula grant, a state gets aid in a certain amount of money based on a mathematical formula. The best example of this is the old way welfare was given in the U.S. under the program called Aid to Families with Dependent Children. AFDC. States got a certain amount of money for every person who was classified as poor. The more poor people a state had, the more money it got. Project grants require states to submit proposals in order to receive aid. The states compete for a limited pool of resources. Nowadays, project grants are more common than formula grants, but neither is as popular as block grants, which the government gives out Lego blocks and then you build stuff with the Legos. It's a good time. No, no, where the national government gives a state a huge chunk of money for something big like infrastructure, which is made with concrete and steel, not Legos and the state is allowed to figure out how to spend the money. The basic type of cooperative... All right, so it's for this type of grant because it's more flexible on how they spend that money. Project grants, categorical grants, or block grants. Which one is it, people? Block. Why do you know it's block? How do you know that? Though? I wasn't listening, but I remembered letting go. <laughs> Uh, it is block grants. He did relate it to Legos. Uh, block grants, they like because they just get given money and then the states get to decide how to spend that money. So those grants are their favorites. So I was watching this to make sure it was all good for you guys. And my son was there and he's 13 and he heard that. And he's like, Dad, is that real? Did they actually give Legos to the states? Yeah. 13. Cooperative federalism is the carrot stick type, which is sometimes called marble cake federalism because it mixes up the state and federal governments in ways that makes it impossible to separate the two. Federalism is such a culinary delight. The key to this is, you guessed it, dollar dollar bills, y'all, money. But there's another aspect of cooperative federalism that's really not so cooperative, and that's regulated federalism. Under regulated federalism, the national government sets up regulations and rules that the states must follow. 
Some examples of these rules, also called mandates, are EPA regulations, civil rights standards, and the rules set up by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Sometimes the government gives the states money to implement the rules, but sometimes it doesn't, and they must comply anyway. That's called an unfunded mandate, or as I like to call it, an unfun mandate, because no money, no fun. A good example of this is OSHA regulations that employers have to follow. All right, OSHA, that's safety people, just so that you know. Uh, regulations are what kind of mandate? Marble cake, unfunded, protective, or cooperative? What kind of people? Bill's the only one getting home, right? Uh, let's see here. Let's call us people. Is this the right one? Yes, it is. Talk to people at your table. You got 20 seconds, then I'm calling on a victim. What is, what is it? Unfunded. Dylan, you actually came up, but I'm not going to call on uh, bro, I said I was going to call some people. Oh, my bad. I wanted to catch Dang. I know he's not paying attention. <laughs> I'm joking, Dang. Wow, you got a little sensor there. That's a joke, man. I know you're paying attention. <laughs> yes, it is unfunded. Thanks, Frankie. It's a joke, man. I know you're paying attention. Follow. States don't like these, and Congress tried to do something about them with the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, or UNRWA, but it hasn't really worked. In the early 21st century, Americans are basically living under a system of cooperative federalism, with some areas of activity that are heavily regulated. This is a stretch from the original idea that federalism will keep the national government small and have most government functions that belong to the states. If you follow American politics, and I know you do, this small government ideal should sound familiar because it's the bedrock principle of many conservatives and libertarians in the U.S. As conservatives made major political inroads after the 1970s, a new concept of federalism, which was actually kind of an old concept of federalism, became popular. It was called, surprise, new federalism, and it was popularized by Presidents Nixon and Reagan. Just to be clear, it's called new federalism, not surprise new Federalism. New federalism basically means giving more power to the states, and this has been done in three ways. First, all right, new federalism gives more power to who? The states. The states. Okay, so hopefully you saw that it goes back and forth, right? Starts off with the states having most of the power, then after the Great Depression and people needed help from the federal government, then the federal government has most of the power, and then ever since the 1970s and 80s under Nixon and Reagan, with deregulation, uh, they go ahead and they bring more power back to the states. But now, it's just a mixed bag. So, uh, with new federalism, again, it's pushing more power back to the states. Block grants allow states discretion to decide what to do with federal money. And what's a better way to express the power than spending money? Or not spending money, as the case may be. Another form of new federalism is devolution, which is the process of giving state and local governments the power to enforce regulations, evolving power from the national to the state level. Finally, some courts have picked up the cause of new federalism through cases based on the Tenth Amendment, which states, The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, or reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. The idea that some powers, like those police powers I talked about before, are reserved by the states, has been used to put something of a break on the Commerce Clause. So, as you can see, where we are with federalism today is kind of complicated. Presidents Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and Clinton seem to favor new federalism with <coughs> block grants. But George W. Bush seemed to push back towards regulated federalism with laws like No Child Left Behind and the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. It's pretty safe to say that we're going to continue to live under a regime of cooperative federalism with a healthy dose of regulation thrown in. But many Americans feel that the national government is too big and expensive and not what the framers wanted. If history is any guide, a system of dual federalism with most of the government in the hands of the states is probably not going to happen. For some reason, it's really difficult to convince institutions to give up powers once they've got them. I've never given up this power. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Crash, crash course government and politics is produced and associated. All right, people. Well, we finished letting this play. This is my uh, other piece of advice. When we do an F puzzle in here, it does not grade it for me unless you let the video finish playing. So if you don't let the video finish playing, I don't get a grade. Put a grade book for you. Okay. So what do you always have to do when we do an F puzzle? Finish the video. Let the video finish playing. Okay. Please, please, please make sure you do. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Almost there. Almost there.
this yesterday. I'm a little kind of like out of order because some classes were able to do that puzzle yesterday and some were not. Did you use this as your exit ticket yesterday? Some people are saying yes and somebody said no. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, go find this right now. And to make sure you know where it is, you're going to go right where it says Federalism Slides Activity and open that thing up and it will be the first slide. Uh, I'm going to give you back one minute to do so, and then based on the video, we're going to have a couple folks share out. But I can see, it looks like everybody's got it done. Unless you weren't here yesterday, of course. Nice. We're going to keep going on this slide deck, so you need it open no matter what. All right, people. Stacy's not here, she can't be my victim. Ooh, Frankie, you're my victim. All right, Mr. Frankie, what is federalism? And give me an example, please. Federalism is what the government is divided into the state and main government. Um, for example, in California, can you put something in the middle? Man, you're like mumbling. I heard federalism is when it's divided between state when and- government power is divided between state and like the main government. What is that main government called? It has three possible the federal, names. The federal government? The federal government. It's also called the national government. It's also called the central government, just so we're all aware. Okay. All right, keep going. And the example? Uh, for example, California can do what? Say that again. California, California can do what? California can enforce can enforce some age limit on who can and cannot drink. Oh, the drinking age? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, that's tricky. So the drinking age actually yeah. got changed by the federal government. They did because it because it is related to interstate commerce. The federal government can make laws about it, but originally it was different per state. You are right until the federal government made a law about it. So that's kind of a tricky one too. Dylan with nine is not here. Nayland, what do you got? Give me an example besides the drinking age, please. I don't need the definition. Just an example of federalism. Another example of federalism is kind of like the state laws for education. Kind of like how one of the groups for the project mentioned how like some states they only go for like four days, but then other states it's like five. Yeah, states need to decide that. Did I give you guys the textbook example yesterday? Can we talk about that? No? Oh my goodness. All right, I know you guys don't look at your textbooks because it's like 2024, but you will notice in the corner of your textbook it usually says the state in which you are in, okay? Publishing companies make this textbook for the whole entire United States, but they have a slightly different version for California, for Texas, for Florida, because the things that get taught in classrooms in different states is decided by those states, okay? So when you get your textbook, it'll say which version it is. Does that make sense? And that's just another example of how states get to make decisions about certain things, right? Education, of course, being one of them. Fantastic. I want one more, one more. I'll take a volunteer. Anybody got a good one? Nothing cringing. I feel like you guys made it cringing yesterday. I know your ringleader Dylan's not here, but another example. All right, well, I'm told it is. Dylan with a Y, what do you got? Not the definition, just give me an example, please. I guess. Good job. All right, so 
Uh, what is the Tenth Amendment? How does it relate to federalism? Anybody want to read? We have any uh, out loud readers up in here? Just hate reading out loud, huh? Oh man, you guys like hearing me talk still? Oh, thank you, David. Saved us from Millie's voice. Uh, take that first little paragraph for us, please, sir. Uh, the Federalists eventually won the debate when the Constitution was ratified in 1789 by the required numbers, uh, number of states, but calls for a Bill of Rights continued. In fact, eight states submitted lists of proposed amendments along uh, with their ratifications. The one ab amendment proposed by all was uh, the principle now contained in the Tenth Amendment. Nice. Okay. So every state that agreed to the Constitution said, hey, there is one amendment that we have to have, okay? And it's the Tenth Amendment, right? So the Tenth Amendment states, the powers not delegated to the states by the Constitution, no prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people, okay? So I'm gonna underline this because it is uber important, okay? So if it doesn't say right in the Constitution that the federal government has that power, like declaring war, negotiating treaties, immigration, etc., then that power automatically gets reserved to the states or the people, okay? So because it doesn't say in the Constitution that the federal government is in charge of education, it is automatically a state power. Does that make sense? So everything the federal government can do, it says in the Constitution that it can do that, okay? So, you're gonna learn about something called enumerated power. So those are the powers in the Constitution that it says it has, and then everything else is a reserve power. Okay? And the reserve power, again, is anything that it doesn't say in the Constitution, okay? And that is hugely a piece of federalism, right? Because federalism, again, is that shared power between the federal government and the state government, okay? All right, people, uh, you're responsible for all three of those slides. They each have a short reading and one or two questions a piece. Uh, I'm going to give y'all about eight minutes to do that. There are sentence starters on those slides, just in case uh, you're not sure how to get your, your response started. <laughs> All right, we'll go. Together. Just make sure all your tabs are like specific to the assignment.
do you? Right here. Uh, and this is uh, after they said one way they did this was to uh, create a federal republic, and it's the sentence after that, I think. Is the state having to follow laws under the federal government, but also create their own laws along the jurisdiction they have? So that like, they have to follow the guidelines. Two it is. Two it is. 
And be real. That was on your test. It's not a benchmark. You just got to know it. Know it, know it, know it. I agree 100%. Which 
liberty or which rights is being violated based on the scenario, okay? So here's our first scenario, people. Samantha is accused of selling drugs. When she appears before the judge, she asks for a lawyer because she can't afford one herself. The judge denies her access to a lawyer. You're gonna have to figure out which of the first 10 amendments, and I've narrowed it down to four for each of these scenarios, has been violated, okay? So your job is to go through and read the amendments. For the sake of time, I'm gonna narrow it down for you to the sixth and seventh amendment. So read through those, see which one is being violated based on that scenario. Go. I'm gonna have somebody share out in like 90 seconds, two minutes. Talk to the people at your table. This is not a test. Figure it out. I think so. What is your team? Go. Check compulsory process for obtaining witness in the future and to have the assistance of a counsel of counsel for his defense. Yeah. Which one is it? What? I'm tired. What? <coughs> Show me where it says you're married to the <laughs> now, Catherine, make sure he gets it. Go team. Come on. We gotta just know. People, you're gonna have to point to the line that proves it. Oh, shit, we're supposed to do <laughs> No, just the first one. Might as well do Alright, we need a victim. And our victim is. Yeah. 
First Amendment? Yeah. And then Liz, you got fifth? Fifth Amendment, yeah. Uh, James, you got sixth? Uh, I just got the dig. Alright. I don't know about James. Reasonable searches and seizures. Which, like, no one ever Not four. Eighth. Eighth Amendment for Jesus Christ. No, nor excessive fines and tolls, nor cruel and unusual punishment. So, like, a, a whipping would be like cruel and unusual. <laughs> Wait, is eighth? Eighth Amendment, um, excessive death penalty, nor excessive fine, nor cruel and unusual. Isn't that unusual punishment though? Like he's getting spanked in front of the school. Yeah, that's right. It's the eighth one. Wait. Fun fact: Texas brought back getting not just spanked, but uh, paddle. You know what a paddle is? Yeah. Yeah. And so, if your parents need permission, the school administrators are allowed to spank you. <laughs> Wait, this is not required. So that's being violated then? Yeah, because it's saying it's saying you shouldn't impose a high bail at the uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't find them excessively and we shouldn't give them cruel or unusual punishment. And wait, so we're just trying to find out like what it's violating? Yeah, which which one it's violating? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got the uh, third amendment for a question. The freedom of speech, right? Yeah, it says no soldier shall in time a peace be quartered in any house. For Christian? Yeah. Cause it's just smoke. I don't know. They arrested him for yeah. for holding an auction. So I think it's the first one. Uh, holding a what? Holding a holding a meeting at his house to discuss action against the oh shit the factor. I think it's second one. For Ray, second one. Yeah. Are we done? Alright, what did we say for the last one? Thank you. That one takes six from that one. Charlie? Sorry, sorry. Right. No, Six is good. For which one? Where he's watching the house. It's the fourth limit. Fourth is the fourth limit? Yes. Yeah. It's the book people against a reasonable church in the CD. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, fair enough. Yes. But it's different for each you all because you're not 18, right? So there's kind of like different schools. But let's say the situation involves all of the building shots. Do you still have something? All your rights, all the rights. What do you think? Go look up. You have the big man. Thank you. Chris Payne is the uh, 
Eighth yeah, eighth minute excessive bell. Uh, four B. <laughs> second. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Third, 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 third. The quarter minute. Uh, our rights are not absolute because if you get sent to prison, your freedom is taken into your life.
morning. Uh, today we're going to start a new assignment. We're not going to go through notice until next week, but I'm going to keep start on this. Um, so uh, work on this only if you're done, if you don't have any missing assignments. There's some people that have to turn in stuff to so you work on those. But, uh, you're going to log back to Deverify, which we did in chapters, the first couple chapters. Um, we'll look for this course, Prescription Drug Safety. Uh, there's eight modules here. That so it's a couple of hours, you'll be able to get this done in a few days. Um, this will introduce you to the topics we're going to cover next chapters, which is drugs, alcohol, and addiction. And so <coughs> you want to log in and start the modules. Each module has a quiz. Get the quiz done in 70% to finish. This will be pretty much a lot of the stuff we're talking about in the next chapter. So get started on that. Um, if you have assignments missing um, from uh, yesterday or the previous assignments, get those done first. I have to do grades coming up, and the college course coming up. Okay? Uh, and then also, uh, the following people need to log in for the code and make the test. Ismail, Leonardo, Isabel, and Nathan need to log in and make the test right now. Code's on the board. Are they in your mind? Are they working on getting more detentions in, or what? So only work on this if you're done with your you have a call with all your assignments. So uh, Nathan, make sure you get your assignments in. His mail.
So, yeah. You're using that? Okay, so I can reset your password. So I didn't bring my phone. Huh? I didn't bring oh, my phone. Oh, you don't need to. I can reset it here. So, MT, what's your ID number? Uh, eight two zero zero eight. Two zero zero eight. Uh, four two zero. That? I think so. Okay, so it's going to be your initials, ID number, and then exclamation point. That'll reset right. your password for you, okay? Alright. So then you use that email address and lock. That's your username and then that password, okay? Alright, thank you.
Find a good stopping spot and then start to clean up. We only have like six minutes left. If you are totally in the IPA, real quick, girls, real quick, real quick, so I can announce to the class. Guys, if you are totally behind, I do recommend you take it home and do it for homework. If you can finish up tomorrow, if you can finish up the day after today, thank you, Louise, or AKA, also known as Friday, then you can finish that uh, uh, the day after today or Friday. But if you have a lot, like if you're only on the intro paragraph and you haven't really started, stick on for homework. Finish that. Yes, Matthew. Happy Friday Eve. Happy Friday Eve. No. <coughs> Friday Eve means that today is Thursday and that yeah, the day after today Friday. will be Friday. I did not say tomorrow. <laughs> You guys, you guys going to get cleaned up though? You get paid tomorrow? Tomorrow. Dang it, you made me say it, Martin, and then they make fun of me. You get paid Friday this week? Yeah, I got paid. Did you? Yes. Give me like weekly or what did you do?